Greetings, folks. Uh, welcome back to uh, the reading of A Journey. Um, it's uh, just a crazy, beautiful day here in the Pacific Northwest. And I have got some painting to do out on the front porch. Uh, so I'm going to get out there in a, in a little bit. But I really was wanting to read um, this chapter today because it's kind of a well, it's a real life-changing time in my life. Um, so I was looking forward to reading this. We're now on, what would it be, episode 11. And we'll be reading chapter 13, Return to Israel. So what else was I going to mention to you? Oh, so tomorrow, uh, I'm hoping it's nice weather because I sort of... Uh, finagled us an invite to this um, annual wonderful big barbecue that happens in the beautiful town of Hansville. And uh, I think tomorrow they're going to have like three bands and lots of wonderful food and down by the water and, um, and it's in Hansville. If you've never been to Hansville, uh, it's a it's a place worth checking out. It's a beautiful little village. And uh, so what else? Oh, next, coming up here real soon, um, in August, Carol and I are going to be helping with a camp for a week for foster kids. And I know that's going to be really, uh, really eye-opening and, and, you know, Hopefully we can be a little bit of a, a blessing to these kids. Um, I know it'll be a huge gift to get to be there. But anyway, life goes on. And uh, we're reading chapter 13, Return to Israel. The weeks following my epiphany only served to confirm that a change in my heart and head really was taking place. Instead of feeling like I couldn't partake in mind-altering intoxicants because I shouldn't, and then struggling not to, I found that I no longer needed to. I'd been given the power to choose not to. Also, instead of looking at a young woman, woman would sexualize, I started to see them as the beautiful creations that they are, daughters who are loved by their father God. I also found myself with a desire like never before to read the Bible and to try to better understand what was written and what I had, for as long as I could remember, considered to be true. Truths like that spoken by Jesus when he said, Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And that's from John 15, verses 4 and 5. I'd been needing to learn that it simply wasn't possible to live the kind of life I was longing for on my own and apart from him. In John 12, 24 and 25, where he said, Listen carefully. Unless a grain of wheat is buried in the ground, dead to the world, it is never more than a grain of wheat. But if it is buried, it sprouts and reproduces itself many times over. In the same way, anyone who holds on to life just as it is, destroys that life. But if you let it go, reckless in your love, you'll have it forever, real and eternal. And that comes from the message. That's what this whole being born again thing was that I'd heard about growing up. Although there was so much at that time that I didn't understand about living a life with Jesus, and quite frankly, there's probably as much or more that I don't understand today. What I was getting for sure was that to believe in and have a real relationship with Jesus was way bigger than simply saying, I believe and then working really hard and trying to follow him, and then ultimately not being able to do it. Or saying, I believe, 
and then just doing anything and everything I wanted to while naively thinking it would be pleasing to God. It meant trying to let go of my selfish, self-gratifying self and letting Jesus be the Lord that he is. To try to follow his direction while remembering that it was only by his grace and by the power that he gives that I'd be able to follow him at all. And so the adventure continues. Sometime after Mom returned from her trip to Israel, she saw an art article in the newspaper about an agricultural community in the north of the country, not so very far from the Lebanese border. Although the settlement was much like a traditional moshav, it was at the same time very different. The members and residents of Nesamim were believers in Jesus and were all non-Jewish. She showed me the story and then tucked it away in a filing cabinet. Now, at a time when I was doing a lot of thinking and dreaming and praying about what the future might hold, I remembered the article. After some searching, I was able to dig it up from my folks' filing cabinet. The newspaper clipping told of a settlement located between Haifa and the border of Lebanon. This very unique Christian kibbutz was established in 1963 by a few individuals and families who, coming from Europe, were well acquainted with the atrocities of the Holocaust. <clears throat> the pioneers who founded the settlement wanted to show solidarity between Christians and Jews by living and working in, the, in Israel and contributing to its growth. By 1979, Nesamim had expanded into a vibrant communal village that, in addition to growing cotton and avocados, was also a major grower and exporter of roses. There's the desert blossoming as the rose again. Like other working agricultural communities in Israel, Nesamim needed volunteers to get all the work done. Their volunteer program, or work-study program, was a combination of working in a variety of jobs while also attending a number of lectures, along with taking trips throughout the country with the other volunteers. The program was designed to help explore the roots of the Christian faith within the Jewish context. Jesus was, after all, a Jew. Several months earlier, when Mom first showed me the article, the idea of returning to Israel to live and work in a Christian community was definitely not among my plans for the near or even the distant future. Not at all. But now, after having gone through some pretty significant changes in my head and heart, and after a couple of weeks of thinking and praying and envisioning the whole possibility, it became undeniably clear that there was nowhere I wanted to go and nothing I wanted to do more. This may have been the first time I ever genuinely and wholeheartedly prayed to ask God for some specific direction in life. Although I guess we can never be absolutely sure as to what we're doing is in line with His great plan for our lives, I was more sure about returning to Israel and about knocking on the door of Nesamim than I'd ever been about anything else prior. My interpretation of the article about Nesimi may have been a little different than what the author was intending. Or maybe I just didn't see some of the fine points. points. Like that part about volunteers needing to go through an application process and being selected into the program. I miss that. There was also the fact that Nesimi really wasn't looking for volunteers from America. Miss that too. What I did see was a part about a diverse community made up of believers from several different countries living in the land where Jesus was born and where the volunteers were part of a program that would allow them to work and learn and hopefully get to know this Jesus better. That's what I saw. Now one might think that if a person were going to jump on a plane heading for Israel, with the sole intent of living in a particular community, that person might have the forethought to first contact the community and make sure they were as excited about his coming as he was about going. Nah, 
We got this. It's all good. And if I may, I'm going to shut this down for a second and go get a drink of water. Okay, back again. I'm still, by the way, well, I haven't heard from Morgan Freeman yet uh, to let me know that he'd like to do the audio version of the book. So, uh, you know, maybe one of these days you'll, you, you'll get to enjoy that. So, Morgan, if you're listening, call me anytime. Incredibly, when Mom and Dad returned from Mexico and heard about my plans to hit the road, they didn't immediately tell me all the reasons why it was a bad idea. In fact, after having a chance to explain to them just what was motivating me and why, they were surprisingly encouraging and maybe a little excited about the idea. <clears throat> I even had a chance to tell my dad about the night out that broke the camel's back, so to speak, and ultimately redirected the spiritual journey I was on. That discussion with Dad was prompted by him asking the question and making the remark, What happened to you while we were gone? You have changed. I knew that I had wanted to change and could only hope that what Dad saw was something real that was actually taking place inside. What an amazing and welcome confirmation it was to have my folks support me in a decision that I know for many parents would have been totally out of the question. <clears throat> they could have easily said, Tim, you're 21 years old, you haven't gone to college, and you don't even know what sort of career you're planning to pursue. Come on, boy, get your act together and reach for that American dream. They could have said something like this, but they didn't. <clears throat> it also surprised me when mom and dad somehow managed not to hear, or at least not to freak out, about the terrorist attack that had just taken place in the seaside city of Naharia, just a few miles from Nesamim. I found myself half wondering if maybe God had shielded them from that little bit of world news so they wouldn't worry. Having had the good fortune of living rent-free for several months and, as a result, being able to save up a fair chunk of change, it was only a few weeks after my folks returned that I was strapping on the backpack and returning to the land of Israel. In those days, there was no such thing as a cell phone or GPS for the general public. What I knew for sure about the location in Nesamim was that it was just a little south of Nahariya. Getting there was simply a matter of asking people the best way to do it. <clears throat> After a bus ride from the airport to Haifa, and then another north up on Highway 4 up the coast, the bus pulled over at my stop. The driver, who I had told my final destination, pointed to a road running next to an avocado orchard. I'm pretty sure there was an avocado orchard there. And stated, Nessa Meme. I hadn't made it very far down this road when a car coming in the opposite direction pulled over next to me and a guy with a big smile stuck his head out of the passenger window asking in English and with an American accent where I was going. The gentleman asking the question would along with his wife become two of my very dearest friends. Lev, the passenger in the car, and his lovely wife Hava were originally from the States, but had been living in Israel for several years. They were at that time the only American members of Nesamim. I told both Lev and Bob, Bob being the driver of the vehicle, and who I think was originally from Switzerland, that I was someone who had come to Israel believing that I should be living and working in their fair village. <coughs> <coughs> Hope I can get over this cough. Both Lev and Bob were probably thinking, oh great, another one of those God told me to come here people. The thing is, I really did feel like God was involved with my coming to Nesamim. Lev got out and headed over to the bus stop that I had just come from. Bob invited me to jump in and after turning the car around, gave me a lift to the village. He brought me to the office of a surprisingly young-looking English guy named Jim, who I'm guessing held the position of administrator of the community. 
<clears throat> whatever his official title, Jim was the guy who needed to decide if I would be given the opportunity to stick around for a while or not. So I'm going to shut this down again and cough my head off a little bit, and drink some more water, and then return. All right, back again. Typically, the only volunteers in Nesameem were those who had gone through the application and selection process. I had intentionally chose not to contact Nesameem before landing on their front door. Truth is, I felt very strongly that I shouldn't contact them first. Jim told me that had I written and inquired about the possibility of being a volunteer, I would have been told that they didn't currently have any uh, ties with any churches in America, and hence no prog program to receive volunteers from America. He ended up inviting me to stay long enough to be interviewed by a small team of community members who I guess were called upon at times such as this. The little committee ultimately decided that I would be welcome to remain as a volunteer and also participate in the work-study program. Did God have anything to do with my coming to this unique Christian community in the north of Israel or with things working out so that I'd be invited to stay? I've always thought that he did. The village was made up of, of a diverse mix of members and volunteers from Holland, Germany, Switzerland, Sweden, and Canada. And then Jim was from England as well. And then there was also Levin Hava, the only American members in the community, and one other American volunteer named Rolf. Rolf was from New York, but I believe, I could be wrong, but I believe he had lived several years in and perhaps was even born in Norway. Rolf was a thoughtful, philosophical kind of guy who had recently graduated from a Bible school in the States and then come to live and work in Israel. Like me, he was one of the chosen few who had been invited to stay at Nesamim without having gone through the system. <clears throat> Rolf became sort of a spiritual big brother to me. And although we haven't seen each other for over 30 years and actually haven't even exchanged letters for a few years, I consider him one of my closest lifelong friends. And actually, I have now um, communicated with Rolf. Uh, so that was wonderful, just within the last few weeks. I don't know how Rolf managed to travel with so many books, but he had an incredible library in Israel and ended up passing along a number of his books to me. This included some classics like The Pursuit of God by A.W. Tozer, The Cost of Discipleship by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the Normal Christian Faith by Watchman Nee, Reese Howell's Intercessor by Norman Grubb, and Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. And those are just a few of the ones that I can remember. <clears throat> what a wonderful, unbelievable gift for a young guy wanting and trying to get to know Jesus better, to be able to live and work in a Christian community where there were several other people on a spiritual journey not so unlike my own while at the same time being able to see the land that the Bible I was reading was actually talking about. And then on top of all that, to be able to read some classic books along the way. Oh, have I mentioned that about a half hour on a bicycle, I could be at a beautiful beach on the Mediterranean. It was very good. <clears throat> In addition to spending a little free time at the beach, I would also occasionally hike through some nearby old growth olive groves and up into the nearby hills. Excuse me, I'm going to have some water. <clears throat> uh, let's see, old growth olive groves, where are you? One day, I headed off with the goal of visiting an old castle ruin that some of the other volunteers had told me about. I knew what general direction it was in, just not exactly how to get there. After a few hours of wandering around the hot Israeli hillsides and finishing off a boat of bag of water, I managed to develop a nasty migraine headache, 
the kind that messes up your ability to see. I was grateful to come across a little shelter that somebody had made by stacking rocks together and for the shade it provided. After hanging out there for a half hour, 45 minutes, my vision started returning to normal. Unfortunately, I never did find the castle ruins, at least not on this trip. On the way home, though, I was fortunate enough to wander into a little community that at the time was made up of, of an American guy named Danny and his Israeli wife, Irit, and their two sweet kids, Carmel and Adam. <clears throat> also living in community Cleel was another American guy named Raphael, along with his Israeli wife, Devora. These honest-to-goodness pioneers were just in the beginning stages of building their little piece of heaven on earth in the foothills of western Galilee. At this particular phase of development, they were all living in tents. <clears throat> Danny and Arit provided me with a much-needed drink of water and also filled up my wineskin before I made the trek back to Nesamim. This would not be my only visit to Community Cleal, as we all became very good friends, and I ended up visiting them often. Little Adam was about a year old, and Carmel, although only three, tried to teach me some Hebrew. She took her teaching pretty seriously and made sure to speak up when I pronounced something wrong, which I did a lot, sometimes rolling her eyes. <coughs> My friendship with the people of Community Khalil really was too good to keep to myself. I introduced them to some of the other folks from Nesamim, and a group of us even ended up helping Danny and Irit to build their home. They had managed to obtain a little wooden cabin that I believe had previously been some kind of military housing in one of the Scandinavian countries during World War II. I just can't remember which one, which country. The walls and roof were already assembled in sections and just needed to be put together on a cement foundation. Skilled construction guy that I was, not. I managed to stab Danny in the leg with a shovel while mixing cement for the floor. It still makes me cringe to think about it. Lucky for our friends at Cleal, several members of the little building team actually knew what they were doing, so Danny and Irit ended up with a sweet little wood cottage. <clears throat> I've mentioned that Jerusalem was one of my very favorite places in the whole world. That only became more true during the return trip to Israel. While living at Nesamim, I would make the 110 or so mile journey to the city of peace as often as possible. In addition to walking the narrow, colorful streets of the old city Souk in the Arab Quarter, another one of my favorite places to visit in Jerusalem was the garden tomb. Many believe that this is the actual tomb belonging to Joseph of Arimathea that the, uh, where Jesus had, was laid after the crucifixion. Many also believe, however, that the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is the location of the tomb where Jesus' body was placed. I think that ownership of this site, the sepulchre, is shared by the Greek Orthodox, Armenian Orthodox, and Roman Catholic churches. Also on the scene are the Coptic, Ethiopian, and Syriac Orthodox churches, which each, with each denomination carefully guarding their designated section. Rumor had it that on occasion, fists would start to fly during arguments over who was in charge of what. While visiting the Holy Sepulchre Church, I was assured by one of the several gentlemen in long robes not sure just what orthodox he was, that this was indeed the genuine location of the tomb. The same gentleman also offered to say a prayer for me, but if I remember correctly, this service was only avail available for a minimal fee. <clears throat> In contrast, while visiting the garden tomb, the first thing you notice is how simple it is. There's a garden and there's a tomb. If you ask one of the caretakers if this is the place, they will likely tell you that not only that they don't know for sure, 
but also that it doesn't matter. <clears throat> They'll probably remind you of the words spoken by the angel and found in Matthew 28, 6, where it says, He's not here, for he is risen. The fact that Jesus is risen and no longer in any tomb is more important to them than where the tomb is located. Although I have no idea if either the garden tomb or the church of the Holy Sepulchre is the actual location of the site where Jesus was laid, it would be very easy to believe that the garden is the actual place. The whole vibe is just so genuinely good. And I don't think anybody there would ever offer to pray for you and then ask to be paid in return. As much as I liked visiting the old city souk in the garden tomb, I also had a few other regular stops while in Jerusalem. Funny how they all had to do with food. A young guy does need to eat after all. I don't know if any of these places still exist, but at that time, there was a little baker shop just inside a Damascus gate known as the Green Door. Wouldn't you know it, the door was green. Inside this ancient old city bakery was an Arab guy baking breads in a clay oven. In addition to bread, he would also use his dough to make you an awesome little pizza, but not just any pizza. <clears throat> he would typically place some cheese and a raw egg or two in the middle of the dough before baking it, and that in itself was delicious. The savvy pizza eater, however, knew that if you made a stop in the market and bought a few veggies prior to seeing Mr. Pizza Man, he would cut up and add those veggies to your personal pizza. Delightful. And you might even notice a hint of smoky flavor from the cig hanging out of Mr. Green Door Man's mouth. Another one, of the several, uh, another one of the several gates of the old city is Herod's. Not far from Herod's gate was another favorite spot for delicious food called Uncle Mustache's. <clears throat> you could always count on Uncle Mustache for a great plate of roasted chicken and rice. But seeing how man does not live on savory food alone, it was also necessary to find a few extraordinary locations that offered something sweet. I was never disappointed by the sugared Turkish-style coffee and baklava or some other yummy baked goodie that could always be found in the old city souk. Sometimes, though, I or the people I was with would be craving as something a little different. On those instances, we would head outside of the old city walls and over to a tea shop called Tea and Pie Don't Pass Me By. In addition to tea and coffee, you could also get a piece of awesome homemade pie. It kind of reminded me of some of the places back home. And after all, there's nothing quite like a great piece of pie. It's a little embarrassing, but my wife will tell you that although I can't seem to remember people's names, I can always remember what, where, and when I ate something, no matter how many years ago it's been. Just the glutton in me, I guess. The members and volunteers at Nesamim were comprised of a colorful mix of religious backgrounds and denominations. Everything from Dutch Reform to Catholic to Lutheran to the oddball like me who grew up Baptist. We met together as a church community on Saturday morning for a pretty traditional sort of service with the exception of everybody being in shorts and sandals. It was Israel and it was hot. I can't deny that one of my favorite parts of that gathering was when we enjoyed coffee and freshly baked cake after the service. There's that glutton in me again. And the lovely European ladies in Nesamim always made a delicious coffee cake. It was on Saturday afternoons that I probably experienced some of the most memorable church that I ever had and perhaps ever have since. Lev and Hava were friends to a dear elderly English couple who lived just north of the community. On Saturday afternoons, these lovely people would open up their house to a group of folks, including Lev and Hava, who were all wanting to try to get to know Jesus better. Lev and Hava were kind enough to invite some of the Nesamimers that they thought might be interested in participating, and I was fortunate to be one of those. 
Although we never officially referred to it as one, I guess you would call this little gathering a home church. Stanley was a retired English naval officer, a pastor, and also the most knowledgeable and engaging Bible scholar that I've ever known. Between Stanley's wonderful, wonderful way of bringing the Bible to life, along with his, with his lovely wife Ethel's incredible English piccalilly that she always made available for our Saturday evening meals together, <clears throat> it was a beautiful thing. If you've never eaten homemade English piccalilli, I can only hope you have the opportunity to try some, because it's good. On our Saturday gathering at Stanley and Ethel's often made me feel like I was experiencing something out of the book of Acts, where believers would come together from house to house for fellowship. And here we were in Israel, no less. Not that I thought being in Israel had some kind of extra added spiritual significance, well, maybe a little. There was, however, no place on earth I would have rather been. Carol and I just received a letter last week from Hava. On February 6, 2017, at 99 and a half years old, it was time for dear Stanley to remove his earth suit and take flight to eternity. In the words of Hava, <clears throat> until the end, his light for the Lord was shining. He was still clear in his mind and remembered the young people who he and Ethel ministered to along the way. I'll forever be grateful for the privilege of knowing this man who made such an impression on my life. I believe he was a classic example of what it looks like to be real, to live out what he claimed to believe. One of the afternoons at Stanley and Ethel's house took place just after the return from a few weeks' holiday in Great Britain. <clears throat> earlier, the, earlier the same day of the meeting, I'd been hanging out with a Canadian volunteer named Paul. We were talking about some of the great music being made by people who were motivated by their relationship with Jesus. Artists and groups like Larry Norman, Love Song, Honey Tree, Keith Green, Second Chapter of Acts, Andre Crouch, Randy Stonehill, Barry McGuire, and others, Phil Kagi, a bunch of others. Paul mentioned how he wished he had brought a tape from his home in Canada, which had songs by a guy named Don Francisco. The one tune in particular he wanted me to hear was called He's Alive. It was a song about the life and resurrection of Jesus as told by the disciple Peter. Well, that evening during the get-together, Paul was there too, Stanley pulled out a cassette tape that he and Ethel had recorded on a little portable recorder while at a, house, a home group meeting in England. He wanted us to hear this great song that apparently a guy was playing at the meeting. It was a song about the life and resurrection of Jesus as told by Peter, and the guy singing it was Don Francisco. <clears throat> Did I believe we had just experienced a God thing? Absolutely. And I'll say, just uh, not so many months ago, you know, I'm thinking, well, could that have possibly, was that really Don Francisco? Was that all? So I wrote a little letter to Don and his wife. Um, they have a website. And I said, hey, you know, here's what was happening. I was in Israel at this time. This, we listened to this tape that I was told was made at a little home group in England. Were you guys in England at that time doing like little home group fellowship stuff? Sure enough, Wendy wrote back and said, yeah, Don was. And um, it, it, so that was, that was pretty wonderful. Another very special time at church that I was fortunate enough to experience while in Israel and will forever remember was a little prayer group that a few of us met together with within the while we were in the old city. I can't recall how we heard about it or, or who from Nesamim was originally invited, but this unique little ecumenical group of folks, which sometimes included a nun or two, met together in an upstairs apartment located on the Via Della Rosa. You know the place. The street in the old city of Jerusalem that Jesus walked on the way to his crucifixion. 
I felt, I felt pretty privileged to be there. My work at Nesamee mostly revolved around the glass houses where the roses were growing. At one point, I was part of a little group known as the D-Team that prepared the D-Glass House for planting. Everything from digging the beds to laying the drip irrigation lines to filling the beds in with tuf, a small volcanic rock used for hydroponic growing. No dirt necessary. The D team included my good buddy Rolf, along with a couple Dutch volunteers who also became my friends. We did make a pretty good team. Another one of my compadres in the community was a big Canadian guy named Jan. Jan was a construction worker by trade and is probably the reason that Danny and Reed's little cottage came out as nice as it did. For a while, Jan and I were responsible for using a tractor with a forklift attachment to load the large and surprisingly heavy boxes of roses into a big truck for transport. This would be my first experience with using a forklift. Hopefully, not too many roses were damaged when I may have, a time or two, poke the fork through a box. At Nesamim, we celebrated both Jewish and Christian holidays and sometimes just had parties for fun. On occasion, we had costume parties. I think it was at one of those just-for-fun costume parties that Jan put on a poodle dress as if he were going to a sock op and came as my date. I went as a 50s gre greaser. No disrespect intended, and not that Jan wasn't a good-looking guy, but he wasn't a very pretty date. Maybe it was the mutton chops. Before going into the party, we thought it might be fun to try to first, to first try and master how to do a back-to-back -back flip so we could awe everybody on the dance floor. We locked arms, and I bent over forward while Jan tried to flip backward over my head, landing on his feet. I'm not sure where we went wrong, but while Jan was still upside down with his feet in the air, he fell off my back and landed on his head. We were doing this on a cement floor. Needless to say, Jan and I didn't impress anybody with our fancy 50-style dance moves, and I'm not sure, but he may have suffered a concussion. It wasn't a very fun date. Um, in addition to loading the boxes of roses, Jan and I were also tasked with replacing cracked or broken panes of glass on the glass houses. Um, sometimes, while working with sheets of glass on the roof, you could find yourself in a precarious position with the potential for losing your footing and fall, falling through. The roof was probably about 10 feet high at its lowest and maybe 15 or 20 at the peak, far enough to hurt a bit when you hit the ground if you fell through. Thankfully, on that occasion when I lost my footing on the roof, it was only my arm that broke through the glass. It's in, it was interesting, to say the least, being able to check out what the muscle inside my arm looked like. I still have a good-sized scar just above the left bicep to remind me to be grateful for not having experienced more damage. So, uh, you probably can't see it. Anyway, there it is. So yeah, it could have been a lot worse than it was. My friend Janet was also among a little group of folks that met at Stanley and Ethel's on, or he was among the little group of folks that met at Stanley and Ethel's on Saturday evening. At one point during our time together, we were looking at the topic of baptism. At one uh, six of us who were participating in this particular study, to include Jan and me, came away with a sincere desire to be baptized. Actually, I think all of us were choosing to be rebaptized. I'd been dunked as a young boy, but honestly didn't really know what I was doing or why. The five others had likewise been baptized before, but as infants, having come from a reform background. For all of us, I think we just wanted to make a tangible statement 
and demonstrate that we really believed in Jesus and truly believed that he'd given us a new life. I'm, I'm well aware that people have different opinions about what baptism is and about what it should look like. Such was the case at Nesamim, and not everybody agreed with what we were choosing to do. The six of us were simply trying to be obedient to the scripture as we understood it and do what we thought we should. In the end, and despite the controversy that was ultimately generated, it was a great day for each of us when on April 12, 1980, we all took the plunge in the Jordan River. Man, I think I've got allergies or something. They seem to be progressively getting worse as I read. Uh, when looking for a little solitude, the underground bomb shelter at Nesamim was sometimes the place I would go. <clears throat> During one of those visits to the shelter, I was reading the Bible and talking to God. Although I knew it probably wasn't the recommended way to try to communicate with the creator of the universe, I found myself asking God if he would please give me a special message. Something just for me and something that on the surface seemed like a reasonable request. I would close my eyes, open the Bible, put my finger on the page, open my eyes, and voila. Whatever verse I was pointing out would be my special word from God just for me. You know what? I gotta go blow my nose. Sorry, guys. So, I'm going to read that sentence again. Uh, I would close my eyes, open the Bible, put my finger on the page, open my eyes, and voila. Whatever verse I was pointing out would be my special word from God just for me. That at least was my hope. After opening my eyes and eagerly gazing upon the text beneath my finger, it seemed pretty obvious that this wasn't the special word from God that I was looking for. The verses were something along the lines of, The sons of Japheth were Gomer, Magog, Javon, Tubal, Meshach, and Tiraz. And the sons of Gomer were uh, Ashkenaz, Dephath, and uh, Togermah. And the sons of Javan were Elisha, Tarshish, Kinnam, and... Uh, wrote a name, and so on and so forth. If there was a special message that was just for me, I wasn't seeing it. Oh well, no harm done. I turned to another place in the Bible, this time just to do some reading. Well, when I did, it was like a verse jumped out at me from the page, uh, as if it had been highlighted. The words were from James 4.3, and it wasn't a verse I was familiar with. It read as follows. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, so that you may spend it on your pleasures. I was actually reading a King James Bible, and it read like this. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss, that you may consume it upon your less. Yikes. So I'm asking God for a special word that was just for me. Not a word that would be good or helpful or anything for anybody else, but just for me. I flip to a scripture that seems pretty obviously not to be the answer to my prayer. God, did, he didn't give me what I'd asked for. Then suddenly, I'm unexpectedly given exactly what I was asking for. And not only is it words on a page that are speaking to my head, but I feel like it's God speaking directly to the needs of my heart. I could then and still can easily believe, that, easily believe that this was a very specific answer to my prayer. And I think I'll mention just today, I have an old friend from junior high that I knew in junior high and then didn't see forever. And we actually reconnected on Facebook some years ago. He's living in um, somewhere near where Elvis was born, I think. So dear Bill, he was like the first guy I knew with sideburns in junior high. Uh, played the drums. And one day we're walking through the Villa Plaza shopping center and Bill goes, hey, wait a minute. And he runs in, I think it was Ernst Malmo. He runs into this store and then he comes running out and he goes, run. So we go running. 
and he's got this Creedence Clearwater album that he'd snatched. And uh, and he hands it to me. He It was a gift for me from Bill. And dear Bill, every day, every single day, he and his wife now post a scripture and some beautiful picture of the flower of flowers from their garden or birds in the garden or butterflies every day. And today, the scripture, this is the scripture that, uh, that, uh, that he posted. So, dear Bill, uh, uh, all right, so now I've lost my place. Tell you, this is, a, I, I kind of have some sinus stuff going on today. It's clouding my head. So let me find where we're at. Okay. As already mentioned, this probably wasn't considered the recommended way to hear from God. For me, I guess it was just kind of like, why not ask and see what happens? Turns out that night in the bomb shelter wouldn't be the only time I played Bible roulette with God. During my stay at Nesamim, there was a time when I suddenly found myself feeling incredibly weak. I mean, really, really weak. I'd honestly never felt so tired. As it turned out, I'd somehow managed to pick up what was a dev evidently hepatitis A. I was never sure where I got it, and nobody else in the community experienced anything similar. Whatever the case, I was given a nice little bungalow to stay in for several days during a pseudo-quarantine. During this mandatory vacation, I was praying for my friend David's dad, who was at that time a hostage in Iran. David was the high school buddy that I lived together with in, in the school bus during our senior year, along with Bart, GJ, and Smokey. Good doggies. His dad, Colonel Thomas Schaefer, was the U.S. military, military attaché and ranking U.S. military officer at the embassy in Tehran when 52 Americans were taken hostage on November 4, 1979. While praying for the safety and release of Dave's dad and the other hostages, I once again asked God for a special word. This time, though, I wasn't asking for something just for me, but rather a word that would be encouraging for Dave and his family. Like during the visit to the bomb shelter, I closed my eyes, opened the Bible, put my finger to the page, and when I opened my eyes, this is what I was pointing at. And suddenly there came a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison house were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everybody's chains were unfastened. That's from Acts 16.26. <clears throat> now I realize that it may be a stretch to think this verse was actually the special word I was praying for. It wasn't until several months later that the hostages were released and there was no earthquake involved. At the time, though, I, I was pretty encouraged by what I read and genuinely thought that it could be, enough that I wrote David about it in a letter. Dave might have thought I was a little over the top with all the Jesus stuff. As far as the verse goes, it doesn't really matter if it was a special word just for that moment or not. I do know that several years later, Dave's dad was quoted as saying, my bottom line was that my faith in God and belief in the power of prayer got me through it all. Colonel Schaefer was, by the way, a hostage for 444 days, and 150 of those were spent in solitary confinement. One day, while a group of us were taking a little break from the glass houses, somebody pulled out a cassette tape they had received in the mail and put it into a tape deck for us to hear. It was a newly released album from Bob Dylan called Slow Train Coming. This was so cool. Bob Dylan, a good Jewish boy, was singing all these great lyrics that were so obviously motivated by the Bible. Songs about his newfound faith and even about Jesus in particular. Hearing the songs being sung by one of the most influential musicians of my lifetime, who was also Jewish, at a time in life when I was trying to get to know Jesus better and hearing them while living in Israel somehow just made it all the more cool. 
<clears throat> Occasionally, if we were in Jerusalem on a weekend, a few of us would go to the Baptist house, a church in the city, for a morning service. During one of those services, the little kids all came out singing, Man Gave Names to All the Animals, one of the songs on the Slow Train Coming album. I wonder if Bob ever knew that one of his songs was being sung by the children at a church in Jerusalem. A couple years after the release of Slow Train, um, Bob released an album called Shot of Love. This was the third of three albums Mr. Robert Zimmer, Zimmerman, a.k.a. Bob Dylan, put out that openly talked about his faith. Not everybody was real happy um, with the type of music Bob was doing during that period. They didn't want to hear about Jesus. They wanted to hear Lay, Lady, Lay. I think Mr. Dillon received a lot of criticism over those years, and, and I can imagine he was, it was a pretty difficult time. It seemed to me that you could really hear the trouble that Bob was feeling in the title song, Shot of Love. For several years after the album was released, I thought about sending Mr. Dillon a letter of encouragement, a shot of love, so to speak. <clears throat> it probably ended up taking at least a decade before I finally put pen to paper and got a letter in the mail addressed to Bob. I never heard back from him, and most likely he never even saw it. Oh well. The fact remains, we could all use a shot of love. After 14 months of living at Nesimim um, in Israel, it started becoming time to figure out what would be happening next. I thought a lot about pursuing the possibility of changing from volunteer to a permanent resident of the community. Uh, uh, living in the Holy Land had definitely been one of the most significant chapters of my life. I couldn't help but to seriously think about staying longer. At the same time, though, and as grateful as I was for this incredible gift of living and working in Israel, I also found myself thinking about the possibility, a possibility, that I'd never, ever been, been something I genuinely considered before. Having grown up during the Vietnam War, I'd pretty much decided that military service was not going to be part of my life. In fact, prior to the end of the draft in 1973, I was someone who would have told you they would go to Canada rather than ever being drafted. That's really how I felt. Now, while asking God what the future might be holding for me, I wasn't just considering the possibility of serving in the military. Surprisingly, I was developing a heartfelt desire to do it, and specifically, to serve in the medical field. After much thought and prayer, I did ultimately choose to leave the land of Israel and head for home. Not, however, until after enjoying one more wonderful trip into the middle and southern parts of the country. Levin Hava had decided to celebrate their anniversary, not sure how many years it was, by loading up the community VW transporter pickup with camping gear and, and an additional four friends to celebrate with them. I was so very fortunate to be one of the four invited to come along for the ride. Four volunteers and a nice little dog named Moochie. It was great to have one more chance to travel into the Sinai Peninsula and once again enjoy the beautiful coastal beaches. No running around naked this time. We camped on the beach of Dahab located on the southern end of the Gulf of Aqaba before the Gulf reaches the Red Sea. At that time, Dahab appeared to be a little more than a few Bedouin families residing in this desert oasis. Uh, one little group of Bedouins who had their tent set up quite near to our campsite even provided us with a minimal fee with some delicious thin bread they had prepared over a fire on the lid of a steel drum. I was sad one morning to see that our neighbors had packed up and moved away without a sound, and also sad that the night before they'd managed to steal some of our gear while we were sleeping. 
literally right out from under our heads. Oh well, it wasn't anything we couldn't live without, and hopefully they found their dig useful. In addition to camping on the beautiful beach, the trip also included throwing our sleeping bags down at the foot of Masada. <clears throat> Masada is an ancient mountaintop bastion, which was the site of the Jewish zealots' last stand against the Romans after the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70. Located in southeastern Israel, Masada sits atop a rock plateau overlooking the Dead Sea. After camping out for the night and being eaten alive by mosquitoes or some other nasty little bug, we got up early the next morning and took a hike up what's called the Snake Path to the top. From there, we could look around the ancient ruins of what had once been a desert fortress built by Herod the Great. Uh, I think it must have been the same day that we also visited and took a dip in the Dead Sea. It's a pretty unique experience to float around on top of the mineral-rich waters of this salty sea with its shores at over 1,400 feet below sea level, making it the Earth's lowest elevation on land. The water makes a person so buoyant that I saw a guy having his picture taken while re reading a newspaper while floating around. It was pretty fun playing in the medicinal mud baths as well. Our tour of the country included a visit to the flower caves where you could wander around the, the unique underground passages created by water erosion of the soft limestone. When you came out, you really did need to brush off the limestone flour that gets all over your clothes. We also made a stop at Qumran to visit one of the several caves where what we've come to know as the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. In 1947, a Bedouin shepherd discovered the first of these parchment and papyrus scrolls inside of some clay jars. I believe the dates, the dates when these documents were written ranges from the 1st century B.C. to the 1st century A.D. The Dead Sea Scrolls are apparently the oldest surviving manuscripts of the Bible that exist today. So that concludes uh, Return to Israel. This next chapter, chapter 14, is entitled Neither Jew nor Greek or Colonel or Private. So um, I'm looking forward to reading that one. Hopefully I won't be snarfing and coughing. Um, I guess if I was a nice guy, I'd reread this one. But we'll see. I'll take a look at it and see how bad it really is. And, uh, and we'll go from there. So once again, thank you for taking your time to uh, have a listen. Um, this is a pleasure for me, Morgan Freeman, if you're listening, I'd love to have you do an audio version of the book and, uh, all the best to you. Adios.